Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. And I'd like to welcome you to a webinar sponsored by IPEN and Commonweal's Biomonitoring Resource Center. And I'd like to thank everyone, especially our speakers, the translators, the organizers, and to all of you for, in, for joining us today for this very important webinar that I think will inform and provide information vital to our work to protect the health of wildlife, people, human rights, and the dignity of all. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce my friend, Cheryl Patton. She's the director of the Health and Environment Program at Commonweal, based in Bolinas, California, the center of the world. She is, of course, as we know, a very dear uh, former IPEN co-chair and also a world-renowned rock star. So I'd like to um, turn it over to Cheryl. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you very much, Pam. Uh, can everyone hear me and see me? Are we good? Okay. Uh, I just want to tell everyone uh, to welcome you all, but to say there are 400 people, uh, participants on this webinar uh, from over 50 countries, which really indicates all our concerns about how to create a toxic free future. I also wanted to point out that when the United Nations was beginning, at the very beginning, they just, the delegates came together and wrote a declaration of human rights. And one of those human rights was the right to bear a family, to have children. And then this right is being eroded by the tide of toxic chemicals around the world entering our bodies. Today's speakers are going to describe the chemicals that have resulted in compromised immune uh, re reproductive capacity and decreased well-being, and will explain how serious flaws and the way we analyze chemicals for the endocrine disrupting properties uh, is not really working. And that results in chemicals not being regulated. And that results in this crisis in reproductive capacity that we're now facing. It's great, my great honor to introduce our presenters, uh, and I want to remind everyone or tell everyone that we'll be taking questions and answers after both presenters have given their uh, uh, slide presentations, but you can enter your questions and answers by clicking on the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, and the speakers will address those questions after both presentations. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Shauna Swan, who has worked for over 25 years to understand the threats posed by chemicals to our environment and to our health. She's developed new paradigms to assess the risks. Of most concern to Dr. Swan are the chemicals in our bodies that uh, our bodies confuse with its own hormones. At the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, Department of Preventive Medicine, Dr. Swan is working with a wide range of collaborators, collaborators to conduct studies and develop methods to evaluate the risk from such chemicals. Her book, Countdown, was released in February of this year, is now available in nine languages. So I suggest that you, you read it as soon as possible. Our second presenter is Dr. Pete Myers. He's founder and chief scientist of the Environmental Health Sciences, a not-for-profit organization that promotes public understanding of the advances in environmental health issues. Dr. Myers served as the director of the W. Alton Jones Foundation as a board member of the Jennifer Altman Foundation. Along with co-authors, Dr. Theo Coburn and Diane Dumanowski, Pete wrote the book, Our Stolen Future, a book that explores how chemical contamination threatens fetal development. He's adjunct professor of chemistry at Carnegie Mellon University, won many awards, uh, including from the US National Institute for Health for his pioneering work uh, in environmental health. It's not, not, not a pioneer, it's basically defined the field. And he was a great promoter and a great mentor to all of us at IPEN in those early days. So thank you very much for both of you to joining this uh, webinar. Uh, Dr. Swan, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and uh, put up your slideshow and, and begin the presentations. So <clears throat> thank you, Cheryl, for that introduction. Thank you, IPEN, for inviting me. And um, I just want to say to everyone here, um, I am so happy that you are here and that you want to hear about this and this message you know, I have the opportunity to talk to you by the miracle of, of modern technology all over the world in all of these countries right now. So I'm really, really appreciative of that. So um, I'm going to 
talk today briefly about the problem that I see we are confronting, uh, the causes, but of course only a limited number of causes given the time, some of the consequences and Pete Myers will continue with those consequences. And then I'm actually not going to talk about solutions because Pete does that so well and has <clears throat> some excellent things to tell you about it. So just about four years ago to this month, um, we published a paper um, that was kind of viral. Uh, it was picked up everywhere. Here's one headline, who's killing America's sperm? Actually, it's not just America's sperm. Um, in fact, although we focused on Western countries um, in our analysis, because that was where most of the data were, there we were not limiting ourselves to America or to Western countries. And in fact, we um, identified um, declining sperm counts in most of the places that we looked at, and we hope to get more data in non-Western countries, just so let's leave it at that. So most of what I'm going to talk about today uh, with regard to sperm count is limited to Western countries, that is North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand. But certainly that's not the only place that the problems are occurring, as you all know, um, because you're on this webinar. So um, let me tell you that the um, sperm decline that we published in 2017 which is on the right side of this slide, was not the first time I or others had looked at this question. This was an old question that went back actually till before 1992, but that was a very important date because that's when the Danish group out of University of Copenhagen published this alarming paper that sperm count had declined dramatically <clears throat> over the prior 50 years. I did additional work which showed similar trends, and I want you to compare the red lines across these studies because they're very, very similar. Those are the Western countries which predominate this analysis. Now, people say, it, why does it matter if sperm count declines? We have a lot of sperm, there's plenty left, there's enough to make a baby. Well, it turns out that when you have a shift in the population, this is a fairly complicated set of slides, but the point that they're making is that when sperm count on average drops, the percent of men who are subfertile drops a, becomes a lot bigger. So it becomes a much bigger problem. And this is data from our study in which we showed that men in central Missouri had only half as many moving sperm as men in Minnesota. And you can see that the percent of men who are in the red area are much bigger in Missouri. Those are men that we call subfertile. And the reason we do is this wonderful study out of Denmark that showed that when sperm count was high, it really didn't matter how high it was. You could have 100 sperm, million per milliliter, you could have 150. The probability of conceiving a child in any month, which is what is shown here, remains pretty constant. But once you get below 40, then it drops off really quickly. And let me tell you that right now, the average in 2011, which was the last time we looked, was 47 million per milliliter, which is getting pretty close to 40. This is not just a problem of men. And within men, it's not just a problem of sperm count or concentration or even their shape or how they swim. There are other problems that men are experiencing. And one of the very biggest ones, I think, is a reduction in testosterone. There's also increase in genital defects in men. And in females, there are problems too. It's not surprising that both men and women should be affected. And some of the problems affect both of them. For example, infertility is a joint problem. And both men and women experience low libido and failure of assisted reproduction and so on. So there's a 
wide variety of problems that are affecting fertility in both men and women. Here are some graphs. I showed you um, sperm concentration in Western countries. That's a 50 plus percent decline in about 40 years. That's a little over 1% per year. If you look at birth rates worldwide, they've also declined 1% per year since 1960. If you look at miscarriage rates, those have increased at 1% per year. So basically we're seeing a decline in reproductive function of about 1% per year. That doesn't sound like very much, but one year isn't very long either. So what are some of the causes? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I want to set aside genetic causes because what we're seeing is too fast for genetics. And if we do that, or left or in its environment. And environment is huge, isn't it? It's everything not genetic. So there's lifestyle factors which are really important, but which I'm not going to talk about today because this is not the focus of this talk. And then there's chemical exposures. And then within chemical exposures, we can break those down into endocrine disrupting chemicals, which you're all familiar with, sometimes called hormone mimics, chemicals that it can affect, interfere with our hormonal systems. And then there are other chemicals which have effects as well. But now focusing on the endocrine disrupting chemicals, I've listed major classes, phthalates, bisphenols, PFOS chemicals, pesticides, flame retardants. And of course, there are many, many more. So, I'm going to focus on the sex steroids because that's what drives reproductive development. And I'm going to pay great attention to the chemicals that can affect testosterone and particularly lower testosterone, what's called antiandrogens. Why is that so important? Because it's the presence of testosterone that causes the development from what you see on the left, which is the undifferentiated sex organs, to male and female typical as driven by the X, X and XY chromosomes um, under the influence of testosterone. Testosterone here is absolutely essential. And so anything that's gonna interfere with that is gonna cause problems in this differentiation. And that's what the small bit of science I'm going to give you today is going to focus on. So what can interfere with testosterone? Well, the phthalates, for one, and those are um, chemicals, as you know, in our products that we use every day, like nail polish, our shower curtains, and they're in soft tubing. They make are water bottles soft? So they're chemicals that soften plastic. They also are added to retain scent and color and cosmetics. And they are really important for the story that I'm telling you today. Because here's a little experiment that was done about 20 years ago in which rats were either unexposed, that's the controls, or they were given diethyl hexyl phthalate in mid to late pregnancy. And what you see is that the controls, unexposed, have a big peak in testosterone in the middle of this curve. And why is that important? Because there's this peak that's needed for that differentiation that I just showed you, okay? Now, if that peak is gone, you won't have that differentiation. And that's what phthalates do. So this is really, really critical to the story. And this was discovered, as I say, 20 years ago. And I should just mention that this phthalate drives down a particular measure called the anogenital distance. It's what you think it is from the name. It's Basically, the size 
of the genital area. It summarizes that size. And that is 50 to 100% longer naturally in males than females, mammalians, most mammalians. When DHP comes along, that measure is shortened more and more with higher and higher doses of DHP. By the way, you don't need these super high doses to get this effect. And in females, nothing happens. So this story of phthalates altering genital development is a male story. Other stories for other chemicals and other endpoints affect females. I don't want you to think this is only a male story, but this particular story that I'm telling you now about phthalates and their effect on this system is a male story. So it turns out that it's not just that distance, which is called AGD for short, but it's also the size of the genitals and also how they function. So in this little schema, you see the results of feeding mother DHP and the creation in the sons of something that has been named the phthalate syndrome. When I heard this and I heard that humans were also exposed to phthalates, I thought, are we experiencing this? Are we humans experiencing this phthalate syndrome? And so I set out to study that. And I asked if the mother is exposed to phthalates when she's pregnant, is her son going to have these problems with his general development? And it took me 20 years <laughs> to do the series of studies that I had to do to convince myself and others that the answer is yes. We confirmed in two large cohort studies published 2005, 2015, that prenatal phthalate exposure causes this syndrome in human males. I use that word cause advisedly because of the mechanistic studies and the animal studies that preceded the human studies and the replication of the human studies. <clears throat> and going back to our, my original slide about sperm count, it turns out that when this distance that summarizes the size of the genitals is smaller, men do have a shorter HD and a lower sperm count. This is really important because now the link from low sperm count to prenatal exposure. Timing, I want to stress with this beautiful image that you won't forget, I want you to think about the fact that the timing of this is absolutely critical. If you think about the earlier slide, I showed you the peak in testosterone. That was not throughout, that was at one time point, and it's true for humans too. And it turns out in our study that when the exposure was in the first trimester, shown here as T1, you saw a significantly shortened AGD, that distance, but it wasn't true later in pregnancy. The other way that timing is really important is just to tell you that phthalates are important prenatally, they're also important postnatally, but, the time, but because of the timing being different, the effects will be different and the prenatal exposures are permanent. The effect of prenatal damage is permanent, really critical. Postnatal damage, you can fix it. You can change the exposure. You can make things go back to normal. So what are the consequences? Well, first of all, you might be surprised to know that once things go awry, once these genitals are not completely developed and sperm count is lower, then men die sooner. They die younger. They have a shorter life expectancy. It's really important, relatively new findings. They also have tend to have more 
morbidity, such as heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and so on. So there are lifetime consequences to the individual. There are also consequences, as Pete will talk to you about, to later generations. And there are also consequences to other species on the planet. So while I've started very small with just the genitals of the unborn male, this is a story that plays out globally, all species, both sexes. And it ties in to sperm decline in Western countries. I wanna point out that we are here at 47 in 2011, we were here. We don't know where we are now, but if we don't turn this around pretty soon, we're going to be in really serious trouble. So I suggest that you read Countdown. It's going to be available this year in nine languages, hopefully more after that. And you can contact me with questions shamaswan.com or info at shamaswan. Thank you. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. And I know there'll be many questions uh, that from our, our participants later. And I'd like to remind everyone to type your questions into the Q&A piece uh, found on the bottom of your screen. We don't have the function now to translate your questions into English. So if you have a question in French or Arabic or Russian, uh, we suggest that you do a Google translation into English and put that English translation into the question and answer session. And we're sorry for this inconvenience, but it's the best we could do. But thank you very much. And uh, I, I know that uh, Dr. Swan is looking forward to your questions later on in this presentation. Uh, I think we're ready now for uh, Pete Myers to talk about uh, what he can tell us about uh, EDCs and regulatory toxicity. Go ahead, Pete. And let me begin by saying what a pleasure it is to revisit with IPEN. I was there in the 1990s as IPEN was launched. And I have to tell you that we had hopes for IPEN, but nothing quite so large as what and large and powerful as what you have become. Congratulations. It's been a long journey, um, and, but I am extraordinarily pleased to see how effective, how powerful and influential IP, uh, IPEN is around the world. So I'm going to uh, reinforce a couple of things that Shauna talked about and what they mean. And then I'm going to dive into some of the key features of endocrine disruption that are important to regulatory toxicology and how seriously regulatory toxicology is failing us today. The first thing I want to do is return to Shauna's brilliant slide of the slope of the decline in sperm concentration. And remember she said that we're at four, in 2011 when the last data were analyzed, for, for when it was the data from, that were last analyzed were available, um, we were uh, at 47. And as Shauna pointed out, if it continues in the direction that it's going um, in that steady decline by, of median sperm count, by 2045, that curve will hit zero or come very close there too. We, science can't make that prediction with certainty, but it forces us, us to ask the question, how can we shift that curve? Because if you, that's only 24 years from now, and the baby boys being born today will be part of that cohort that has a low sperm count, We're vanishingly close to zero. It's really important that we get ahead of this. Um, what, the, what does this mean? Well, it means humans are the canary in the coal mine. Humans are not alone in this. Wildlife are also being affected, as Shauna said. We don't know full, the, the full story, the full magnitude of those effects. But that's in part because it's taken millions of dollars in research to establish the level of certainty that Shauna described for humans. And we haven't spent that money on other organisms on the planet. We've got some hints 
that are very concerning, but nothing with the level of detail that is available for people today. But people, I'm certain, are the proverbial canary in the coal mine. Uh, here's just one example, which I find particularly troubling. It's from a group of French scientists studying ants all around the world, um, particularly in South America, Africa, and Europe. And every ant that they measured, that they sampled, had phthalates in their skins, their cuticles, every ant. Um, from a, more than a dozen countries on those three continents. And when they began looking carefully at this, even in the middle of the Amazon forest, they were finding phthalates in the cuticles of ants. And when they did experiments, they discovered that the levels they were seeing, that they were measuring in ant cuticles were sufficient to impair reproductive uh, behavior in female ants and were sufficient to interfere with immune system function. What we know is that EDCs are now abundantly ubiquitous, ubiquitous in the environment. They're on the highest mountains, they're in the Arctic snow, the Antarctic deep, the bottom of the Marianas Trench, remote tropical rivers, sandy beaches worldwide, they are everywhere. So how do they get there? Well, we carry them. We put them in landfills from which they leach. They evaporate. The wind blows and carries those chemicals in air currents around the world. Rivers and oceans also help distribute them. They get into animals that migrate and carry them upstream and in, in river migrations of salmon. There is no uncontaminated place on earth. None. I want to give you a brief example. This is work done in Costa Rica, looking at banana plantations and the pesticides used on those plantations. What happens? They spray pesticides, some of which are endocrine disrupting compounds. They spray them and because it's hot there and the banana plants are in the sun, much of the chemical evaporates, gets into the air, and then the trade winds carry that endocrine disruption laden air upwind or downwind and up the mountain slopes that are downwind from the banana plantations. As it as the air rises, it cools. The air, the chemicals condense and they fall into the cloud forest. And those cloud forests in Costa Rica actually are more heavily pesticide contaminated than lowland forests adjacent to the banana plantations. This is a process that takes place all around the world. It's not just fertility. Substantial science now links endocrine disrupting compounds to a wide array of today's epidemic diseases that are non-communicable. Things like hormone related cancers, heart disease, diabetes, obesity. This collection of today's diseases, today's non-communicable diseases that have gone epidemic is vastly larger than we suspected when we wrote Our Stolen Future in 1996. So um, where do hormones and EDCs come from? Hormones come from various glands that secrete them into our bloodstream. EDCs come from the petrochemical system, but chemically they can be very similar and behave in the same ways. And let me show you something about this. Hormones get into the bloodstream, they're carried around, they go past cells that may or may not have hormone receptors. If there's no receptor, there's no response. But where there are receptors, hormones stimulate changes in how genes behave that are needed for a fetus to develop properly. They can be, those receptors can be on the surface of the cell membrane or in the, the nucleus of the cell. When EDCs are present, they interfere with that process. They hack the hormone signaling and they make it so that crucial genetic events don't happen. I have to tell you a couple of key things about 
endocrine disrupting compounds that are generally true. They are effective at very low concentrations. Here's a, a plot of uh, the concentrations at which hormones in blue, EDCs in red, and classic toxic agents are causing problems. Hormones begin to have their effects far beneath the part per trillion level in serum. EDCs begin their effects also beneath the part per trillion in serum levels. Toxic agents start in parts per million. So there's a vast difference between the sensitivity of organisms to EDCs and hormones than to classic non-hormone hacking agents. Well, let me um, comment on uh, something about a part per billion. What do you think a part per billion is? Well, I'd ask the question, how many, a part per billion of uh, colleagues of mine have calculated is more or less a one pancake in a stack of pancakes 4,000 miles high. But think about it this way. How many molecules are in a drop of water? How many molecules of, for example, BPA, a famous endocrine disrupting compound, are in one drop of water at one part per billion? That number is 2.65 trillion molecules of BPA in one drop of water, which is a lot of molecules to cause hormone hacking. Um, and we're now learning through new science that's coming out that that estimate of low dose effects extending to the parts per trillion may be dramatically wrong. This paper and papers similar to it are finding indications of hormone hacking at a million fold level below a part per billion, 10 to the minus 18th. Uh, uh, this science is just beginning to emerge. Uh, this is an important paper for that, but um, we may be missing a lot because of ultra low level effects of hormone hacking compounds. How, how is, could this possibly be true? Well, hormone and EDF C effects are amplified by cellular machinery. In the cell membrane receptors, this happens because of a compound called cyclic AMP that, that literally take a single receptor uh, hormone binding event and multiply it a million fold. Similarly, the nuclear receptors work via M, uh, mRNA, messenger RNA and ribosomes and it's machinery that takes one signal and amplifies it more than a million fold. This amplification process is something that does not take place with traditional toxic compounds. This is a graph that shows the, along the bottom, you've got the hormone concentration increasing from one to 100,000 uh, parts per, per million. What this is looking at is how many receptors on a cell are likely to be occupied at different concentrations. And you can see the curve increases as concentration increases, but it turns out the effect of the increase is most sensitively received at the low doses. By the time that you get into the range up in the upper uh, right of that graph, um, the toxicological range, there's very little change in receptor occupancy. And what that does is amazing. At different concentrations, different genes are affected. As you go up the curve of concentration in the graph on the right, the, um, the response changes, but it's not changing the same for each gene. Different genes are turned on at different doses. And sometimes the genes that are turned on at one dose actually are turned off at a higher dose by another set of genes. So you have this feedback loop that's built into the system that leads to behavior, of, leads to effects that are dramatically different from what you can see in traditional toxicology. At high concentrations, the gene expression systems, that is the effect of the hormone hacking, actually become desensitized to further increase which is completely at odds with basic assumptions of regulatory toxicology. It's much more complicated than the classic Paracelsus higher dose assumption means that, assuming that it means more of an effect. Different effects 
take place at different doses. This is crucial to understand. What that means is a high dose testing cannot detect low dose results. It's simply impossible. This is called non-monotonicity. It is absolutely crucial you get a basic understanding of non-monotonicity if you wanna engage in debates over uh, how endocrine disruption should be uh, regulated and how to determine what's safe and what's not. I'm gonna show you one example of an endocrine disrupting compound that at high doses uh, fights breast cancer. But because not all tamoxifen is metabolized by a woman who's taking that medicine, it gets into the water stream and it becomes a micro pollutant. This is work showing that at high doses, parts per thousand, tamoxifen suppresses the growth of a breast tumor. You can see with the red asterisks that the parts per thousand level is dramatically different from the control, the line across in the middle of the, of the graph. What toxicologists do to understand safety is they start at the high dose level and they work down the dose response curve until they find a dose that is not different from the, um, the control, which in this graph is, is this one here. It's called a no observed adverse effect level. They then, uh, they, they may have a few data points beneath that, but they never test much farther below. Instead, what they do is they estimate using certain assumptions, what level would be safe and that's usually a thousand fold beneath the no observed adverse effect level. It's the safe level, the reference dose in the language of the US EPA. Unfortunately, if you actually do the experiments, which regulatory toxicology never does, you wouldn't know that actually at the safe dose, tamoxifen stimulates breast tumor growth, exactly the opposite of what happens at parts per thousand. And then if you work down the dose response curve further, identify the, oh, I, the, um, that safe dose in women actually produces something called the tamoxifen flare. It hurts because the tumor is growing. And doctors try to manage the dosing regimen so that a woman doesn't stay at that dose for any great length of time. You've got to get to the higher doses where it actually begins to cause a beneficial effect. But if you work down the dose response curve, discover the true NOEL where there is no difference between control and experimental, and then, then do the extrapolations to what safe, that safe level is in actuality vanishingly close to zero. These are experiments done by, in this case, Wade Welshens at the University of Missouri. These experiments, this examination of the full dose response curve is never done in regulatory toxicology. The safe dose is estimated from a very small portion of the dose response curve. So non-monotonicity is key. If you don't understand the endocrinology of non-monotonicity, you have no business testing for safety of EDCs. Unfortunately, the regulatory agencies around the world refuse to acknowledge the scientific importance of non-monotonicity. So that means that every test for safety they have ever done has, has been insufficient, has been flawed. You will get it wrong if that's what you do. This is not rocket science. It's basic endocrinology. It's taught in introductory endocrinology courses. People have won Nobel prizes for this work in real science. It's not, and, and this is really important because some of the advocacy community has, has, have has misunderstood this. It's not that lower doses are stronger, it's that they have different effects than high doses. When you see one of those non-monotonic bumps in the curve on a graph, all you're doing is looking at one dimension of that chemical's effects. Other things are happening in that organism at other doses. They can be bad also. So don't argue that lower doses are stronger, they're different. And what that means is that high dose testing can never work to figure out what's safe and what's not if you're dealing with an endocrine disrupting compound. There's some other important EDC features that I'll list here, but I don't have time to go into in detail. 
no thresholds exist for hormones or EDCs. And that's because the hormone system is already acting. It's already engaged. It's all, its engines are already running. So you don't have to start it. It's already there. So small amounts can cause changes in something that's already running. Second, EDCs interact in mixtures. So think of it this way. What's the first question your physician asks you as he or she prescribes a new medicine? What are you already taking? This should be a fundamental dimension of regulatory toxicology, but it isn't. Mixtures are almost never addressed, and yet mixtures are always there. Shauna mentioned this. Classic regulatory toxicology at best looks for do exposures affect the mother and the fetus? Unfortunately for us and for the world, we now know without question that effects can extend beyond the fetus to next generations. And these are effects that are not caused by changes in DNA sequence. It's a complicated issue. It's called transgener transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, but it's real and no regulatory test has ever attempted to assess transgenerational epigenetic inheritance in any testing scheme. We now know of examples where when the mother has been exposed and the fetus gets exposed while in the womb, that fetus doesn't show some of the harmful effects that will be seen in later generations. So this is called generation jumping. We've got to dramatically change how the regulatory system addresses this issue. It's one of the best arguments for precautionary approaches to these things that you will ever see. No regulatory standards have ever been set based upon these biological realities. I can't emphasize that more. We've got a lot of work to do, but when someone tells you that this stuff isn't science, tell them how many, ask them how many Nobel prizes have been based upon this type of work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Myers, for this very informative presentation. Um, and I think almost we should take a moment and then to contemplate what it will mean to live in a world where there are no longer babies, or it's very difficult to have children. Uh, this is such sobering information for us all. And, and uh, I think we all need to take a deep breath and try to understand what we need to do and how to do it to stop for this from happening. We do have a few questions. We probably won't have time for you and Dr. Swan to answer all of them, but we'll try to get some of the questions the most outstanding to you later and perhaps get a response that way. Uh, one question it has to do with, uh, is from Fernando Bejerano from Mexico, who asks, are the effects of uh, in your exposure to EDCs are those amplified by other kind of uh, situations that an individual might live in, in terms of uh, inequity, poverty, uh, poor diet, and so on? Were those uh, effects be exacerbated? Be exacerbated? Um, I, I'll answer this first, but Dr. Swan is actually doing, has been doing some research in this area where stress, for example, uh, amp interacts with chemical exposures to amplify um, the, the effects. And it's to be expected because it turns out that the genes that are whose expression is changed by endocrine disrupting compounds, they can also be affected by stress. And so that's, that is the path by way by which those interactions can take place. Um, I'd like to answer that. Um, and it's a great question. Um, the answer is um, when populations or individuals are compromised by stressors other than necessarily psychological stress, but they could be stressors on their systems, uh, inadequate nutrition, um, and, and so on and so forth, prior illness, <clears throat> they um, will have greater effects. We just showed in a paper that's just coming out now that in our four cities in the United States that we study, the one that's most disadvantaged is actually the only one that we see showing <clears throat> adverse effects of BPA on certain neurodevelopmental outcomes. The better off communities that are higher SES, we don't see that. 
So um, this is to be expected that you take a compromise system, you stress it further in, by chemicals or other means, then it's going to um, have more of an impact. Um, so there's a huge environmental justice issue here. I just want to mention that this is not the only one of these uh, uh, way that this is involved with environmental justice. There's also the question of greater exposure to disadvantaged communities all over the world, higher exposures. And there's the question that it's much more difficult to remedy if you don't have the resources to, for example, if you're living in a food desert, you can't buy unprocessed foods, you can't buy organic foods, you can't buy those healthier skincare products, you can't use assisted reproduction if you're having problems, you can't afford to get your sperm banked and so on and so forth. So I think it's a very important question and it should be driving all of our research. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is, uh, is the individual who's been uh, exposed to an EDC, say phthalates, in the womb, are they uh, more susceptible or vulnerable to the toxicity of that chemical later in life? Wow. I love that question and I don't know. Maybe Pete has some answers. I, we've not studied that and that's a brilliant question and I think it's something that we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Fred Von Saul has done some fascinating work on fetal exposure to BPA, finding that um, it changes the, the way the genes respond to subsequent hormonal signaling. It's a classic set of experiments and it has a horrific effect because what it ultimately leads to is bladders that explode in adult male mice. Um, and that's because the, the response of specific genes and specific tissues in the urethra of the males that were exposed in the womb, their response to adult stimulation by estrogens um, is to constrict the urethra so you cannot pee anymore. And this is just, I'm, I'm sure there are many other examples. This is a very dramatic one. Um, bottom line, fetal exposure can alter the response of the control of gene expression later in life. And that means that exactly what you imagine here in your question can take can and does take place. Okay, then there's a follow up question to that, which is, you mentioned that the, the harm can be inherited in subsequent generations. So would those subsequent generations also then be more, more vulnerable to uh, exposures to an EDC? I, Shauna may want to answer this, but there's a f another famous experiment by Pat Hunt, Dr. P Patricia Hunt at Washington State University, looking at a, a at transgenerational inheritance in an unusual way. In the classic transgenerational experiments, you exposed one generation, the grandmother, to um, EDCs or whatever. And then there's no further... Uh, exposure in the rest of the uh, in the rest in the rest of the life of the experiment what dr hunt did was she continued to expose subsequent generations to the same levels of contaminant and the what she found was that um, the consequences of that continued exposure multiplied amplified the effects of the exposure and there's some thought which is, is plausible to me that the continuing decline in sperm count is in fact a result of both the initial exposure in the 1950s when we really began to encounter EDCs commonly in our world, the initial exposure then, but subsequent exposures have taken place every generation. And so somehow the sperm count decline is continuing. Shauna, do you wanna comment on that? That's exactly what I would have said, Pete. That, that, that this is, um, um, alarming and, and relatively new insight. And, and Pat's paper on this came out at the same time as our 2017 decline paper. And they went together beautifully because her, her study explained our decline. In, in fact, um, I can post a link to an essay I wrote in 2017, pulling these two studies together and, and pointing this out uh, on environmental health news. I'll, I'll give that to Charles, figuring out how to distribute it. 
All right, we'll, we'll collect uh, some of the papers that you all have mentioned and make sure everyone who's, uh, well, we'll post them on the IPEN website and, and the Commonwealth Biomonitoring Resource website too, so people can have access to them. Uh, another question, would it be wise to have a, a sperm count uh, tested in, in most countries as a way to monitor exposures? Would that be something that would be useful? I, I, I think that's it. Excellent idea. And there have been groups internationally calling for that. There will be surveillance of reproductive function. We have very limited surveillance of birth defects. There are some countries that have birth defect surveillance. We have cancer surveillance, but we don't have um, reproductive health surveillance. And unfortunately we can't do that on the female because you can't count the eggs very easily, but um, uh, it, it would be uh, so valuable to have um, a, a a measure of a representative sample of men <clears throat> whose sperm count was measured the way CDC measures in the NHANES, the body burden of environmental chemicals. I would simply uh, add that uh, Shauna has been a world leader in attempting to organize a network accomplishing exactly that. Mm -hmm. It's tough. And she's worked for decades uh, now to try and make that happen with, mm -hmm. with a methodology that can be shared with confidence across all those studies. But that's, that's a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I should say, um, it's actually to men's advantage to know their sperm count. Um, I know it's difficult to get it tested, but it's not so difficult anymore because men can send in a sample, they can collect it at home, they can send it in, um, it can be um, completely private. And once they know what their sperm count is, they have information about their health. For example, you want to know your cholesterol or your blood pressure. Why would you not want to know their sperm count when it predicts your longevity and your future health? Uh, thank you for that. Is there another question? Is there any way to know when a, a baby boy is born, whether or not he's been exposed in utero at a critical time of development? Is there any way to know that? Well, the distance that I talked about the anagenital distance is actually a pretty good readout of how much androgen he was exposed to in utero. So that is one way you can know that. But if you happen to have, as we fortunately did, saved urine from the mothers when they were pregnant, you can get a lot of information. So the, the window into uh, the exposure profile is through the biosamples uh, that women could supply during pregnancy. Um, it wouldn't be, urine is very cheap to collect, to store, not difficult, not particularly sensitive. Um, these things can be stored for a long time. We now are doing a study on samples from serum, very tiny serum samples from the early 1990s, looking at PDCs in relation to autism in another study, just mention that. So very old samples, when they've been stored, can be useful for learning about what prenatal exposure was. Mm -hmm. um, work by Dr. Barbara Cohn uh, in Berkeley, California, has taken advantage of s stored uh, samples of umbilical cord blood from the 1950s, and then using that to try and uh, examine the effect of the, the associations between chemicals that they can detect in those very old samples with the health conditions of the babies and the baby's daughters and the, and the next generation as well. So those samples can be incredibly valuable and every country should try and build a, a database of stored samples like that. Mm -hmm. It'll be good. Uh, is there any way to counteract the effects of a, a in utero exposure. I mean, di different diseases that result from that, of course, can be treated one way or another, but there's any way to counteract what has happened uh, chemically in utero. Unfortunately, I think not, um, because those very, very early developmental changes, as far as we know, are not reversible. However, modern science is doing lots of miraculous things. And whether, you know, later addition of the missing testosterone could somehow um, fix the problem, not yet, but um, I'm, not, I'm not close to that possibility. What do you think, Pete? Um, fixing is really difficult. The alternative way to think about that, though, is are there 
aspects of the diet during pregnancy that can be used to counteract the effect of the chemicals before they cause damage. So there is some work showing, for example, that BPA effects in, um, in mice, in baby mice, can be, counter can be prevented by a diet rich in uh, methylation processes. Um, so, but this work is, is in its infancy. Uh, much more needs to be done. Um, we do know that a range of birth defects are amenable to having pregnant women take the right vitamins. That's probably a way to interfere with the harm being caused by uh, a range of different effects, including EDC effects. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. Uh, we're almost out of time. Perhaps one last question. Is there any research about these results that also happens in Asia? Uh, because most medical doctors in this person's country, I think it's India, don't give us any information about avoiding plastic packaging or certain skincare products. So how, what can we do to erase awareness among the medical profession in our own country and to uh, help people avoid plastics? Um, I'd like to say um, that it's not just India. Um, physicians do not get information on this, these, this problem in their training. They don't learn about EDCs. There's very, very limited environmental information that's taught to physicians. And in a physician's busy schedule, they don't take an environmental history. They don't ask about your exposures. So it's not just Asia. I think all over the world, we have to have physicians own up to their responsibilities to protect our bodies um, by giving us this information. Um, until that happens, we're going to have to rely on the web and good resources. Um, and um, IPEN is helpful, of course, and valuable. And there are many other organizations that you can turn to to get information. I, I would point out, Sean is actually absolutely correct about the ignorance of the vast majority of physicians. But in a number of Asian countries, for example, there are communities of people studying endocrine disrupting compounds. Almost every day I monitor publications on endocrine disruption and almost every day in the list of papers that comes in, there are two or three from China. China has a strong community of scientists working on this. I've actually lectured to the Chinese National Academy of Sciences on endocrine disruption. And there are other countries as well. Japan was a leader early on in EDC work. The scientific communities are present. You've got to I would recommend trying to build contacts with leading scientists from your country who work on this and then work with them to help educate physicians who often are the translators to the public. Okay, thank you very much for these um, responses. They're very informative. And uh, I want you both to know that we're getting many comments about the quality of your presentation and expressions of gratitude for this information. So many people are thanking you that have joined in this, this uh, webinar for the information you have delivered and for your responses to questions. I need to stop the questions and answer period now, uh, but we'll have a, we're keeping track of the questions and we'll forward these to you. And if you can respond to some of them, that would be much appreciated. And we would post those answers on the IPAN and the Commonwealth Biomonitoring Resource uh, Center uh, website. So thank you both again. It's, it's a sobering, interesting, and, 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 and also inspiring and gives us a, as Pete always says that, and also Shauna, uh, help us direct efforts to create a toxic free future. So Pam, do you wanna go ahead and uh, move us into closure? Yes, thank you so much, Cheryl. And I just wanna ex express my gratitude to our speakers, especially the translators, the organizers, and to our speakers, a special thanks for sharing your knowledge and enlightening us and informing our work with this both disturbing and profound information that does inspire our work. And I think we all need to ask ourselves how we can use this information to shift the curve and change the way that chemicals are regulated. Our collective work is just vital from the local to the international levels to change to a precautionary approach. And we would be very interested and glad to hear any recommendations that any of you might have for follow-up and next steps, if there's information that would be helpful 
to your work, please do let us know. And finally, again, thanks. And I wanna again commend and recommend Dr. Swan's book, Count, Countdown. It, it really is a fascinating and important read, I think for all of us. So again, thank you. Thank you both Dr. Myers and Dr. Swan and to everybody who participated. Thank you so much.